Hi guys, welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to show you how to paint. <laughs> Not really, just going to show you a little bit about what I'm doing. And uh, uh, it's, I know this is not a, a uh, very exciting project, but it's something that we all do. We want to make the stuff look good. So I'm going to go through just how I mask this stuff off and what I used to paint it with. And uh, then I'm gonna get into some plating, but we, we all have to do this stuff. It's part of the game. I apologize for the heater running, but it's Montana in the winter time. It runs all the time. So let me show you what I'm doing here. Okay, I've got my uh, cylinder here pretty well taped off. I just want to show you, you know, you don't have to sit there with a, uh, a razor blade and cut all this stuff. If you just take a hammer and just lightly tap around these edges and lightly is the key word here. And if you get in, get into some of these little cracks, use the ball end of this. But it just pretty well comes right off. So that's an easy way, but there again, lightly do it. Now, I've taped up all the, all the holes, put a screw in here where the oil injection line goes, that'll get plugged on this one. Uh, and I sandblasted this the best I could. And it's, it takes a while because you've got to get down into all the fans and everything. Yeah, there's a little bit left. I'm not too worried about it. But, you know, just plug what you can. Uh, just use your imagination. Now what I'm using is uh, Rust-Oleum and it's ultra high heat. This particular one is what they call extra rich color. It's a semi-gloss. Uh, the number on it is 241-169 black. But get ready when you go in to buy this. I just, I didn't compare all over town or anything, but this cost $12 a can. The regular stuff without the uh, semi-gloss is about half that. So, but I, I like the semi-gloss. I think that's more of what the original color was. So that's what I'm gonna use. And although it does, I do, ma I do mark on them though how much they cost so the wife doesn't go use it for a uh, clay pot for a planter or something. I always kind of try to do the really hard part first, if I can. You know, that's kind of a slow process because you've got to, you got to paint and then you stop and let it dry and then you move it and so on and so forth. But you got to get up on both sides of those fans and, and down in where the jug is. And really the top and the bottom should be just about the last things you, you squirt. So that, that dries and uh, so you can still see some there that I missed. That's what you gotta look for is all the stuff that you, you think you got, but you didn't. Okay, on the plating aspect of this, uh, I've got my brine with uh, uh, some parts in it right now. These are, uh, these are the nuts that I'm plating. And I don't think I have any of those in there right now, but this, this is the crankshaft nut. And it's in there getting zinc plated as we speak. Uh, you, you put a little brightener in it to uh, 
make them shinier. But if you want shiny parts, you got to polish the parts. And I usually just do it on a wire wheel. Uh, then I've got my power supply over here and it doesn't take a lot. And you can actually use batteries or a, or a, uh, a battery charger or there's any number of things that you can use for power supply and it doesn't take a lot. I, I plate or have plated a lot of parts so I've got a power supply but you don't need one. And uh, kind of the first thing we do is we start over here. I've just got some, they call it SP degreaser and it's a it's just a really uh, fortified cleaning agent soap and it works best at about a hundred and I think 120 or 125 degrees so I put it in a uh, put it on a hot plate and <clears throat> then after uh, we plate them we dip them in the zinc chromate which gives it that iridescent gold uh, color and that's what this is so there's it's not difficult but it does take some learning and sometimes things happen that you uh, uh, you know things mess up or whatever you can get them too hot I this here bath I try to try to keep it around 100 to 110 degrees and I just periodically turn the heater on It's got a thermostat on my heater here, but it it really doesn't seem to work very good and never has. So I just kind of watch it, keep the temperature where I think it ought to be and just watch it and turn it off once in a while. Uh, but I've got these parts left. I've got, uh, I don't know, about seven or eight things in the bath there right now that are zinc plating. And then I've got these over here that I've already done. These are some of the new uh, head bolt washers that I made. Uh, this is a uh, magneto or flywheel washer, and that's the flywheel nut, and then a couple of the uh, head bolts. And you know, I don't think that the head bolts or the or the washers really had that coating on it, but I just kind of like it and it gives it another layer of corrosion preventative by having the zinc chromate on it. So I go ahead and put it on. For the type of parts that I'm doing, it takes about 40 minutes in this bath here to give it the zinc. And it's really only when I go to, to dip it into the zinc chromate, it you just kind of dip it however to the color that you want. You know, if you want a light color, it doesn't take very long, maybe a minute. If you want a little bit darker, like my stuff, I, I probably have them in there for two minutes. And uh, it's, just, it's just a thing, you know, it's by eye and by choice. And this stuff, um, let's see, I think I got some head bolts in here. Yep, see here's the here's, uh, what it's doing right now. And you can use it this way, or you can put the zinc on, or the, uh, the chromate on it. And the chromates are in different colors too, but the ones that we're most uh, uh, familiar with are the yellow. And that's, you know, you go to the hardware store and a lot of the bolts have that yellow iridescent coating. Okay, I'm going to pull uh, this stuff's ready to come out. And uh, let me see here. First thing you need to do is kind of rinse it. I use distilled water and a spray bottle there. And then we'll go over here to the uh, and you can kind of see what it looks like. And then I'll start just rolling it around in here. It doesn't do a whole lot at first, you know, it's just kind of on there. It's not soaked in yet. It, you've got to zinc plate it first. That's how you get it. Um, that's what it attaches to. You've got to have the zinc on it in order to uh, 
be able to do the cat or the chromate finish. <coughs> okay, then you you spray it off with the uh, distilled water again, and then you just you can kind of dry it. And you can see those hues starting to come in the the red and the green. Once it's dry, then you can handle it. And we're putting some more stuff on. This This wire is actually copper wire. That's what it needs to be. It can't be steel. But it's it takes on some of the, uh, uh, the coating itself. So it doesn't look like copper anymore. But we're loading it back up. And you, you can kind of get creative with some things so you can get more on one wire, like with the uh, washers here. And we check our temperature again. Probably needs to, it's about 104, so it's still okay, but I'll turn the heater on. And then we'll turn the power back on down here. <clears throat> and I've got what I, what I like for small parts like this. I've just got it written up here, two, three on my current and the voltage at 0.5 and uh, I just, I've got a little cheat sheet here where I hook the, the negative to the bar, which is right here, which everything's hooked to, and positive goes to the anodes. That's this right here. And I've got four of them in there, so they are all hooked in uh, series there. So we'll let them go for about another 40 minutes. And here's our finished parts. Yeah, some of them are pretty rough, but they, they'll work. And actually the bad part of them, you'll never see. And these here, this is the uh, counter shaft sprocket. I got two of those. I did an extra one and the lock and the wire loom bracket. So hopefully I've got everything done that I need done. Okay guys, I've got a, I actually do have a carburetor for the uh, MX that I'm working on that I need to clean also, but I've got another one that I'm cleaning right now. Uh, and a lot of people uh, think that they've got to fill their ultrasonic cleaner completely up with carburetor cleaner and that's not the not the uh, case at all what I do is I get a paint uh, measuring cup like this you can get it from your paint store or the hardware store and I just take find one that will fit in this here is really good for this one fits right in there and you then just uh, fill it up with your carburetor cleaner. I like to kind of strain it. I don't want to introduce any other problems into it. These paint cups that I've got here are uh, pretty much chemical uh, you're just not going to have any trouble with it. They they resist the chemicals. This one's kind of going down there a little deep, so it wants to spread out 
but just uh, go ahead and put your lid on it and what I do is I, I clean it up real good on the outside and I tape it because these are not the best uh, lids and they will leak a little bit so I put a little electrical tape on it now if, if you've got other uh, things that'll fit uh, a peanut butter jar these seal up really well and they can go in your ultrasonic cleaner and this is a bigger paint uh, cup measuring cup from the hardware store so this one won't be any problem getting this carburetor into but for now this is what I'm going to do I've got my uh, ultrasonic cleaner heating up and I'm probably not going to be able to get this tape with my gloves on yeah I did just clean that up good and then tape up the lid you can also if you've got room and the item that you're putting in there isn't heavy enough to weight it down to the to the bottom then you can put like a piece of steel or something in the bottom of it to hold it down but this should do it uh, you know to a certain point and I just go ahead and flip it over like this with some tape also once you've got it all taped up then you just let me get you over here okay I've got one of these big ultrasonic cleaners that I, I used to use it for four barrel carburetors all the time but it doesn't care whether it's in this other container so you just put that in there and I, and I usually just have a, a soap and water mixture in here and then that'll that'll heat up just like it always does with with it bare it'll just take a little longer to heat up but the vibration and everything will go through that and it'll clean just as good as if you put it into this without the container and this is what I use there's several different products out there but this is uh, the chem dip it's a it's a Berryman product and it's carburetor and parts cleaner you can use any number of ones and this one you can kind of see the looks like the rust on the side of it here that's why I filter it it probably won't be long before the the thing eats a hole in the bottom that's kind of how it usually goes because they just don't use it that often and generally for carburetors on motorcycles I don't clean them with this stuff but if there if there's really something stuck in them somewhere up in an orifice or something this is how you got to do it you got to have a chemical uh, even if it's gasoline you've got to have something in there to to uh, break up whatever's in there and along with the vibration and the heat uh, the ultrasonic cleaner has it will really do you good but these are really good they're not real chemical resistant uh, you know I have used them for a while with uh, some chemicals I if I remember right it doesn't like this stuff but it'll take gasoline okay for a couple of times anyway and the, this is just another paint cup it's just a bigger one so these are uh, pretty impervious to chemicals certainly because you can use paint with them not just household paint but automotive paint where you're using reducers and thinners. Anyhow, just a little uh, uh, bit of information in case people are not aware of it. This is what I do. All right, we've got to get our snap ring in this case. And 
And again, we've got an oil hole in here. I think I think you can see right here. So you want to make sure that your snap ring is not blocking that oil hole. Okay, got one more here I can put in. And I don't have any holes there that I need to worry about. Okay. And this one will go in after the bearing goes in. And then we've got uh, some of these little plugs that need to go back in here. Just kind of clean up the area that they're going to go with some uh, isopropyl alcohol. And then we'll let that dry a minute and then we'll put the uh, adhesive in. Okay, again, I'm just going to use a little black RTV. And again, it's kind of sparingly. Don't need a lot. Get all that extra out of there. All right. I'm just kind of flip the thing over and remove whatever's on the that got pushed on the inside. This is where your your shift fork pins are going to go, and they don't need to be competing for room in there with that. Uh, silicone and same with uh, same with this one okay we've got uh, I've got the bearings in so we're gonna go start finishing that up uh, I've got my bearings they've been in the freezer we didn't have enough snow it hadn't been cold enough for a while so my bearings are in a bag in some ice here and i'm going to go ahead and heat this up to about 200 degrees i've got a piece of metal underneath it so it's Try to stay away from my seal over there. Of course, I forgot to put my glove on. Hopefully, I won't need it.
that one not wanting to go. Like I said, the there's a big difference between 13 below zero outside and the freezer that you have in the house that's probably at uh, you know 20 degrees or something like that. So but anyway I got it in. I just had to keep tapping at it instead and back it up with a with a block. And uh, I'm gonna back this one up too. <clears throat> I I'm gonna try to heat that because I it just it's just better if it goes in a little easier. So I'm gonna try to heat this. Now another thing that you may have noticed too is this one had been repaired with a sleeve. Uh, evidently it, the bearing was loose at some time so they uh, they put a sleeve in there which it's a good repair there's no cracks or anything that I can see so that's what they did and uh, now we're gonna see if we can get uh, this one in here and I'm gonna go ahead and heat that one up Hopefully it'll go a little better because we're not dealing with a stainless steel sleeve too. We're just dealing with aluminum. Okay, up against the clip on that one. Yeah, those not going in there as easy as the uh, mains did when I had those setting out in 13 below zero. It's a big difference. Okay, we should be done with this case. And our final bearing will be the needle bearing here. <clears throat> And I'm going to go ahead and heat that one up a little too. Okay, we're up against the clip on that one, so that's good. And then we've got the one I'm going to reuse here. These usually fit in there pretty good. Okay. So then we've got some seals that goes over here. So let me get set up to do those. And I've already got my RTV on there. Okay, should be good.
Mm -hmm. I think that's about all we can do. I've got a Kickstarter one left. We'll get to some point. Okay, I'll just well get it in. This is the side case I had to repair, had a crack, and uh, I went ahead and sanded this side down flush, and I've got a, a weld that goes across here, and I had to build this uh, up just a little bit. But this one looks pretty good. It's got a few little nick, nicks and stuff in it up here on the top, but not too bad. So we'll go ahead and get that in while we're sticking seals in, then we'll be done with it. bunch of extra stuff laying around there. All right, so we're done with the seals. Okay, let's see if we can get the crankshaft in and give it a little, a sparing little shot of uh, assembly lube. Okay. And just a little bit of oil on the, real thin oil here on the bearing and seal journal. And the same over here. No shims on the mag side. All right, we get hooked up here. About five hands for this. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let me see if I can find a wrench for that. Okay, got my big wrench. Start to pull into the bearing. Okay, I think we're done. It's all good there. Turns free. Remember this is the crankshaft that we put the sleeve on, stainless steel sleeve here. And this side's going to get our our shim. That was the only purpose of that shim is to make this width of this uh, assembly 62 millimeters. That's the only reason for that shim. And it brought us out to uh, like four thousandths uh, under 62 millimeter. And as you remember, they say that the uh, uh, six, you know, you can have 62 millimeters and I think it was 0 0.05 millimeter under, but nothing over. So this put us just below 62. Okay, I think that's about as far as I'm going to go today. And uh, we can get started loading the transmission, or at least checking over the transmission. I've got, I've got to go through everything. I think everything's okay, but I just want to go through and uh, check every specification and uh, make sure. So at this point, We've got it kind of started back together. Okay guys, there you have it. We've got kind of got it started on the assembly. We went through a little bit of the uh, plating and some carburation cleaning. Uh, just a technique that I thought, you know, maybe some not, not everybody would know. I'm sure a lot of you do it. It's just a way to, so that you can keep soap and water or whatever you use in your in your large ultrasonic cleaner and you can still use uh, gasoline or carburetor cleaner or whatever and it works pretty good just if you're using those little paint cups make sure you tape them up otherwise you'll probably get water leaking into them uh, you don't have to worry about anything leaking out of them but uh, the water will leak in if you don't get those sealed good so hey, thanks for going along on the ride, and we'll see you next video.